First of all, thank you for showing up. I'm aware it's lunch break at the moment, so thank you for skipping that one and attending this talk. Um, um, well, where do we start? First off, um, I would like to talk about storage management with an open source product slash project that we are working on named OpenAttic. Um, at first, I would like to get a quick raise of hands about two things. Who of you has heard about Ceph before? So you're familiar with that. Excellent. In case you want to learn more about it, um, um, I'll be frank, I will not go into much detail about what Ceph is all about, but there's an excellent talk by Owen right after mine where he will be talking about all the good things that Ceph can deliver. Um, and also out of curiosity, who of you is familiar with OpenAttic? Have you ever heard of the name before? Fewer hands, okay, well, doesn't surprise me. Um, the interesting thing is that um, we've been around for about five years by now. Um, so let me start with shortly explaining what our vision is and where we come from. Um, I work for a company named IT Novum, which is based in Fulda in Germany, about an hour, one and a half away from here. Um, and, and they started working on OpenAttic as an, an in-house project uh, more than five years ago by now. So <clears throat> like so many open source projects, this basically started by somebody has, having a need to scratch an itch, resolving a problem that they're facing. Um, for them, it was... Um, well, the offers that they receive from the large traditional storage vendors for uh, storage replacement systems. So they were, IT Novum has a, a branch that, that runs data centers for other companies as a service. They needed more storage. They were asking for quotes from all the usual suspects like EMC, NetApp, and so on. And the, the prices that they were getting were quite ridiculous. Um, and so they thought, well, <coughs> maybe there's an option for that. And why don't we try doing this by ourselves? Well, <clears throat> interestingly, if you look at a, a current Linux distribution nowadays, um, out of the box, it usually comes with everything that you need to set up a full-fledged storage system. So um, the kernel provides NFS support, there's Samba for SIFs, um, there are various projects that um, offer support for things like iSCSI and so on. And basically, in theory, you could just slap a Linux on a server box and be done, right? Uh, in, in reality, it's a bit more difficult because, well, all these services need to be managed and configured. And especially when it comes to the, the block storage, things like iSCSI fiber channel, um, you need to have a lot of expertise in setting those up. And finding administrators that are familiar with all these various tools and, and, and managing them um, it's, it's a bit more difficult, especially if you are in an environment where most of the administration is done by people used to using a graphical user interface. Um, so just putting a plain Linux system somewhere in the data center usually is, is not getting you very far because there's, there's no integration. Um, you have to take care of simple things like monitoring and so on. So it, it becomes a bit more challenging in practice than it sounds in theory. So the, the vision behind OpenAttic really was to create uh, an open source storage management system that sits on top of an existing Linux system and allows you to easily <coughs> manage those resources with a web interface, for example. And the focus here is really on, well, quote, traditional storage. So um, OpenAttic um, focuses on NAS functionality, so file-based services like NFS Samba, but also block-based services like iSCSI fiber channel only. Um, OpenAttic is by no means something like OwnCloud where you can install your calendar application or your chat program or a gallery or whatever. There's a really strict and strong focus on storage management only. Um, one of the things that kind of came up over time is that customers want sometimes want more storage than they can well, put into a single system, so for example. Um, usually you have a, a PC with a JBot, lots of disks attached to it, and that usually gets you quite far already. In fact, OpenAttic is even capable of what we call multi-node support, so you can set up multiple PCs, which are all running an instance of OpenAttic, but they can all be centrally managed with the same web interface. So that already gives you some opportunity to scale out if your storage requirements grow without having to set up a completely second independent system. Um, but it was also clear that <clears throat> the management overhead simply gets too big, but fortunately other um, projects were thinking about similar challenges. 
Um, and, and one of the projects that we have started looking into the beginning of last year is the Ceph storage cluster, basically, where you, the, the software, Ceph itself, performs things like maintaining the, the redundancy of the data, doing the load balancing. Um, it does a lot of automated things that make sure that the cluster is always in a healthy state and your data is secure. And if you want more storage, you just cram in another system and, and Ceph usually gets you up and running with this additional data quite quickly. So for users of OpenAttic that were running into these limitations, um, for them, op um, Ceph really is, is the, the option to go with. So we started adding um, Ceph support to OpenAttic at the beginning of last year, and we're still working on that. Um, the whole thing is available under the GPL, um, and IT Novum also gives you an option to purchase support subscriptions if you if you're running OpenAttic in your data center in a, in a mission critical environment and you want somebody to ask or to blame in case there's a problem, um, we stand up for that and provide the support. The, the model of OpenAttic itself has drastically changed over the time. And when I joined the company in, in July last year, um, back then most of the development was done in-house by the developers employed by IT Novum. And every once in a while, they just released a new version of OpenAttic, and, and basically that was about it. It was under a GPL license, but everything else was pretty much done in a very closed source fashion. So some of the things that we've changed in the meanwhile, and one of the key differences is that um, we've got rid of the previously existing dual licensing. Um, there used to be an enterprise and a community version where the enterprise version had a few additional feature bits on top that you would have to pay for. Um, it was only available under a commercial license. If you wanted to contribute to OpenAttic, you would be required to sign a contributor license agreement. All those things that open source developers hate with a passion. Um, we got rid of all of that. Nowadays, um, you can just submit patches to us using the contribution process that has been um, established in the Linux kernel community. So you just put a sign of by message with your email address under your change set description, and that's all we require. So a well-known, very well-established process is in place here. And in addition to that, we opened the entire development process to the open. Um, the bug tracker, for example, we use Atlassian Jira. This is now a public instance where you can um, submit bug reports yourself. You can look into all the issues. You can review, comment on them. Um, we also use Jira not only for bug tracking, but also for, for our feature tracking and roadmap. Um, so you'll be able to take a close look at all the features that we have in, in the pipeline that we are looking into, what we're currently working on. Um, we, we try to group them in, in, in a yeah, story, so to say. So there's always a context about the various work items and issues. Um, also, we've changed the way how releases are being done. We now do um, a release once per month, basically. So every four to five weeks on a semi-fixed schedule, we do a new build. Um, and to make that possible, you also made some changes in the way how we work on the code base itself. Um, initially, there was just one line of code, which was the default branch. We use Mercurial and Bitbucket. Quite contrary to all the other projects that use Git and GitHub, but it's basically the same tool gets the job done, and so far we don't really have a, a strong motivation to, to break our existing processes. Um, so we, we created a second branch called the development branch, and this is where all the development takes place. Um, we perform public code reviews, we do pull reviews, uh, pull requests on, on Bitbucket. So it, it's very transparent now to follow what we're working on. Um, there's a, a very nice integration between Jira and Bitbucket where you can create new branches for an issue um, that you want to work on. Um, you can create, if you create a pull request that fixes a certain bug, Jira will auto get automatically give a pointer to that pull request so you can review it to see how the change looked like. So the whole trans process is much more transparent and more easy to follow. Um, so all these things were done in order to yeah, build up and grow the community around OpenAttic. And so far, the efforts are paying off. We see much more users looking into it, trying it out, giving us feedback, and yeah, also giving us guidance on where we should be heading. Um, right now, 
the, the storage management functionality in OpenEdit is, is pretty mature. The, the code base behind it really has been around for several years now. But with version 2, we made two significant changes. And the most visible one is that we have a new web UI interface, um, which has been designed from scratch. And we also threw out a lot of craft that has built up over time. Um, the OpenEdit version 1 was capable of, for example, configuring things like FTP servers and other weird things. Um, who uses FTP nowadays? There are a few, okay, but in, an, in a regular data center you usually have other means of, of doing that. So we try to kind of clean up and get rid of features that we deemed were no longer really necessary or kind of are out of scope. So I, I don't envision that Open Attic will ever turn into something that allows you to manage containers, for example, or install random applications. So for this, there are other projects around that do this on a much better level than we do. Our focus really is on, on the storage management side. So compared to, to other projects out there, um, as I said, focus really is on um, storage management, particularly how you would run it in a data center, not in a home environment. Of course, um, nobody will stop you if you want to run open attic on your home server as a replacement for your proprietary NAS, for example. But be aware that, um, well, there are lots of services missing that you might have become familiar with on, on other NAS devices, sync and share and what have not, um, are out of the scope for the time being. Um, yeah, the, the change in, in the licensing really means that it's fully open source, GPLv2, do with it whatever you want, use it in your data center, in full production. Um, there is no arbitrary restriction or limitation on the functionality, so there's no funny games with we count the how much terabyte you store, and based on that there's a license fee. Um, none of that happens. <laughs> we have a, a very low entrance barrier for adaption this way. It's all based on stock Linux tool chains. Um, we basically just built a management tool on top of the existing tools to better integrate and automate them. Um, we also support multiple Linux distributions. Initially, um, OpenEdit came from the Debian Ubuntu world. Um, sometime last year, they added um, RPM packages for Red Hat Enterprise Linux and derivatives. So RPM-based distributions have started to be covered. Um, and lately, we also now include support for SUSE Linux on the build service. I have a, a slide with more details about that. So really, the, the choice of, of, of Linux distributions as, as the pillar underneath gives us a lot of um, yeah, broad support when it comes to hardware. We basically can, if a user has a certain preference for a Linux distribution and is keen on or would like to know if, if his hardware is well supported, usually the, the, the distribution vendors have hardware certifications that we can point to. If it's supported by the Linux distribution, it will work with OpenAttic. That's basically it. And in comparison to other storage management systems, which are sometimes based on BSD derivatives or Solaris derivatives, um, the Linux user base is simply much larger, so it's, it's quite easier to find users and developers in, this, in that area. So a bit of a feature list. So one of the big highlights really the new web UI, and I have a few screenshots later that I can show you, um, that was built from scratch using more modern web technologies. Um, also the way how the open attic server, or the backend itself, um, is being controlled has changed. We've now created a REST API. In, in former times, it was based on XML RPC, which works of, as well, but somehow isn't as, as popular and as hip as a REST API is. So that's one of the design choices that we've made. Um, we support the common storage protocols. Um, on the file side, in addition to NFS and SIFs, we also allow creating simple HTTP shares. So if you just want to share files, and give access to them through a web browser, we can set this up as well. <clears throat> On the Sun side, the block storage devices, we have iSCSI fiber channel. Um, we are using LIO for that in the background, which is a, is a framework part of, of most Linux distributions. <clears throat> we also support quite a wide range of file systems, as you can see. Um, traditional storage is performed using LVM, the log Linux logical volume manager, to kind of manage the underlying block devices. And then you could, can put the regular Linux file systems on top if you want to. 
Um, we also support ButterFS and, and the ZFS file system if you want to install it separately. And we make use of some of the features that are available through ZFS, like snapshots, for example. Um, Opnetic also supports creating mirrored volumes, and we use DRBD for that. Also, a quite well-known and established technology. Um, the goal is that when you create a new volume that you want to share, there's also basically a selection box that allows you to check, okay, please mirror that volume to that node, and then you have a synchronous replication of the data to a second machine. As I said, it's, it's multi-node capable. Um, you can set up more than one open attic node. The only thing that they need to share is the Postgres database, um, which stores the information about all the nodes that are connected and the volumes and shares that they manage. Monitoring is built in. Um, we started using Nagios for that. We basically set up a small Nagios instance in the background um, in com combination with an, a module which is called PNP for Nagios. Uh, and we automatically create new um, monitoring services for Nagios when a new volume is created, for example. So you, will have to be, you are able to see utilization graphs. There's a way um, to get notifications, for example, if, if the disk space runs out. So all of this is done automatically when you create a new share, for example. You don't have to take care about that yourself. And of course, the self-management part. Um, this is still heavy under development at the moment. Um, some of you may have seen the press release that we've done with SUSE earlier this year. Um, IT Novum and SUSE basically agreed to collaborate on, on extending and expanding the self-management capabilities of OpenATIC. And um, SUSE is a great partner to work with. They give us excellent feedback and, and support and, and, and help us to make the right steps in the, in the right direction when it comes to SEF. Because, well, I have some more detailed slides about the SEF management part later on, but it's a pretty complex project. And if you're new to this technology, um, there's a lot to learn. And it, it takes a while to, to get a clear picture on what you are looking, actually looking at. Um, right now, development is primarily sponsored by IT Novum, the company. Um, but we're trying to open up and, and are, of, of course, looking for more contributors, people that are interested in working on the code base, starting with bug reports and, and feature requests, and hopefully at some point also more contributions in the forms of patches and, and, and new features. A bit more detail about the components that we use. The OpenATIC backend is basically implemented in Django, so it's based on Python. And we use the Django REST framework to put the, the RESTful API on top of it. We have a, a separate process that runs on each open attic node, um, which we call the system D, but it's not the system D that you're thinking of. That's just a, an unfortunate name collision. That's also a Python process. Um, you can see it in an architecture diagram in the next slide. And well, we, we, we started with using Nagios for the monitoring part. Um, on SUSE, we actually use Isinga and, and that port and a work to change that has been done by SUSE, for example. That's one of the things that they've been working on. The web front end, which talks to the REST X API exclusively, is based on AngularJS using Bootstrap. So a pretty familiar design, uh, very common um, libraries and tools. So that allows us really to, to quickly find new developers because we use technologies that have been around for a bit and are well mature and, and, and get the job done. Here's kind of a high level architecture diagram. Here, that part in the middle basically is the Django application. We use a Postgres database to um, persist the data that we need to keep track of. Um, for example, what, are, what volumes are created, what disks are attached, how many nodes do we have, the users and all these things. And the web UI basically uses HTTP to talk with the REST API. Um, but the same API could also be used by any client application. You can basically write a script using curl or a small Python script that issues REST API calls to perform tasks. So you don't really have to use our web UI if you want to automate things like creating shares or volumes. Um, all of this can be done in a scripted fashion using this API. Um, here you can also see a hint of how we are talking to the Ceph cluster. Um, more on the challenges in, in a later slide, but there are 
various ways on how you can interact with the Ceph cluster and, and there are several tools and APIs and it, it's somewhat unclear which really is the best choice here or was the best choice. And we decided to go with the Python bindings to Ceph libraries, there's one library called Rados, another one is called RBD. Um, I think Owen will explain those acronyms in more detail what they really mean. Um, and then here's our system D, which is in, in a separate process running on each node. This one actually runs under root privileges because this is the process that makes changes to the operating system. It writes configuration files, it can restart and stop services. Um, it creates the logical volumes, it creates the file systems. So it's decoupled from the Django application, which runs in the Apache context on the Apache web server, and they communicate over Dbus on, on the local system. So the Apache, app, uh, the Django application sends the message via Dbus to systemd to perform a certain task, and then it gets the, the result output back. And down here, you, most of the time, this is really running shell commands. So NKFS, LV create, all these things are triggered and called automatically by systemd with the parameters that we have first defined. Um, alternatively, for LIO, for example, we also make use of Python libraries that perform certain tasks. So systemd is quite flexible in that respect. Depending on what kind of job you want to get done, we can either simply issue command line calls or we run library calls or whatever. OpenAttic on SUSE Linux in particular, um, We've created uh, an OBS or a project on the build service called File Systems colon OpenAttic. Um, we started working on that, I think, October last year. So these packages have been around for quite some while. Um, right now we build on Leap and Slash. Um, and in particular, I would like to thank Eric Jackson from SUSE, who basically took over the maintenance after I've done the, the initial porting. Um, I haven't been working on the build service for quite a lot, a long time, um, but it also helped me to really iron out a few bugs that where we made some hard-coded choices that were not really applicable on other distributions, in particular path names. Um, yeah, if you, one of the things that we've learned is that supporting multiple distributions might be great for a user, but it's really, really painful for an ISV because um, in the end, it's just Linux, but there are so many minor differences, and, and package names and path names is just one thing. Um, you can really see that the distributions have diverged in so many ways, and, and there are so many subtleties that you have to keep track of um, that makes maintaining multiple OSs really, really hard. But I, I think it's a, a, of benefit for the user that we basically go through those pains in order for him to, to to or pick the distribution that they are most familiar with and get going easily. So um, you're probably familiar on how to integrate packages from the OBS. I won't go into detail here. If you're finding any issues with that, depending on if it's OBS related or OpenAttic specific, please report a bug. Let us know how it goes. Things that we can improve or change um, are always welcome. Okay, let's talk a bit about development and, and, and roadmap in particular. We're not done yet. Um, who knows when we will ever be? There's always more work to, to get done. Um, as I said, the basic storage management functionality is in place. With one on, on the storage management side, there's one kind of big limitation that right now, in order to get started with things like LVM or ZFS, you first have to do some work on the command line. So the, the part missing in Open Attic right now is that you are able to select disks through the GUI and and then select what you want to do with them, like create a zpool or create an LVM group out of these. Um, this first step has to be performed on the command line and after that OpenAttic can take over and manage the story within that pool. Um, so these are things that we will or that we want to have finished and done before OpenAttic 2.0 is really final and can be declared stable. Um, <clears throat> Other things um, right now, for example, we, we basically have a, a Python script that you run that scans the, the system for all the block devices that are available. And we would like to change that to use UDEF instead because, well, the Linux operating system knows about it already. In, in general, we want to make more use of information that's already available by querying the subsystem for the data instead of kind of doing our own thing. So, um, OpenAttic by itself, 
is con developed in a very modular fashion. So for most of these functionality, there's a subsystem um, or a submodule that can is also packaged separately. Um, for example, if you don't want to use ZFS, you simply skip the package during the installation and, well, ZFS support is gone. Quite simple. Um, yeah, things like smart um, hardware rate controllers. We, we, we added support for three-way rate controllers a few years ago by now. But nowadays, they are not that popular anymore, so somebody would have to take a closer look at adding support for more modern rate controllers here if he's interested. Um, this is more of low priority for us because, especially if you look at file systems like ButterFS or ZFS, um, they usually prefer having access to the raw disk anyway, and they don't want any controllers or layers in between um, to, to get their job more, more effectively done. So hardware rate controllers, who knows, maybe we might even skip that part because they are kind of becoming obsolete and, and there are other ways around it. Um, the team is pretty small, so we really have to keep a close focus on the things that are important for us and the feedback that we've received from our existing users. Um, the DRBD volume mirroring for now is um, it's, it's imp fully implemented in the API, but the web UI part is still missing. Um, so that is stuff that is being in the pipeline. And we want to add more features, especially to the iSCSI fiber channel features. Um, there are, I'm not very familiar or experienced, especially with fiber channels, but we have a, a few pro users here that have pretty strict requirements or strong demands that we need to take a look at. Um, but all of this is public, so if you go to our JIRA, you can take a look at all the open things that are, that are around there. And if you think that one of the things that is currently on our list is important to you, um, JIRA supports adding your vote, or you can leave a comment any way that raises our attention to it. We can basically revisit this, the discussion. Okay, that's it about traditional storage in a way. I, I'm going to shift focus to self-management here. Um, but at first, I would like to ask if you have any questions so far. Um, one of the things I usually prefer is that um, there's questions going on right during the talk. If, if you have an opinion or no, a bit more about a topic, just raise your hand, leave your comment, and so it's more of a dialogue. But if there are no questions, I'll continue. Okay. Okay, so self-management was basically the decision of for us on how to scale out storage for our users. Because um, right now, if you look at it, Ceph is basically configured and managed on the command line. There, there are a few um, graphical tools, um, but most of them really are just dashboards that basically monitor and visualize the, the performance of an existing Ceph cluster. So Calamari is, is probably the most prominent representative here because it's developed by, or it was developed by the Ceph developers themselves. Um, it's pretty flashy, the, the UI looks quite impressive, colorful, lots of animations, but from an administrator's point of view, it lacks a lot to be desired. Um, it, you can see that it was initially or primarily created to have something to show investors that the technology really works and, and this looks cool. Um, but from a productive point of view, a calamari really lacks quite a lot. And as far as we can tell from the outside the development of Calamari has basically ceased and at some point last year the developer split the web UI part from the, the back-end part and um, the web UI hasn't been updated since then. There's some work going on in the back-end but um, it, it's really challenging to get a grasp on where Calamari is heading. Um, if you, if you look at how Calamari is implemented, you will see that there are quite a lot of similarities to how OpenAttic is structured. And we, we initially took a close look at Calamari's server, the backend part, to, to think about if, if it makes sense for us to use it for performing management tasks. But due to the unclear roadmap, and especially be, the, the additional requirements that you would have to install just in order to get Calamari running, um, made us reconsider the decision. Um, interestingly, Intel has been working on a tool called VSM, the Virtual Storage Manager, for several years. Somehow this project never really got off the ground from my impression. A few vendors adopted it, and I think SanDisk is actively working on it. Um, but it, 
from what I could gather, they, they had a hard time really building a community around it. Um, looking at the code base, uh, I, I can sense why this is the case. It's, it's a pretty big and complex thing and it takes a while to wrap your head around it. So um, BSM is still around and it, it's pretty powerful with a strong focus on especially the storage management part. Well, since Intel is a hardware vendor, they want to sell their servers and disks. This is really the area where they had a lot of focus on. Um, another tool worth mentioning here is Ceph Dash, for example, but there are at least three or four more of them. Um, they all do some part of it, but none of them, I would say, is really the, the unified solution that we were looking for. So. Limited functionality, unclear roadmaps, all these things basically convinced us that there might be an opportunity and there might be a need for something like a self-management and monitoring tool. And with the, the, the infrastructure and framework that we already have in place, I think OpenEdit is very well suited and already has quite a good code base to start from to add the self support to it. So we, we started on how, well, what would be the best approach in managing self by itself. And the, the goals that we really came up with was that we wanted to create um, a, a GUI tool that can do both management and monitoring. Um, and of course, something that you as an administrator really want to use in it, that gives you useful information at the time you need it. Um, one of the things that we want to keep in mind during our design is that we don't want to overwhelm you with basically useless information. So if everything is running fine, I don't need to print 10 green blinking lights or green lights that all show all these nodes in my cluster are healthy and fine, you don't need to care about them. Um, so to reduce the clutter, we really try to condense that information as much as we can and keep it simple. But if there is a problem that, that needs your attention, you should be able to quickly um, find out where it's happening, what is happening by drilling down and, and seeing what the problem actually is and how you can resolve it. Um, so. Another thing with Ceph is that, well, it's not just one machine. You're talking about hundreds, maybe thousands of machines with several thousands of processes running on them and a similar amount of disk drive that you need to watch. So another challenge really is to, to create a management interface that doesn't completely swamp you or overwhelm you with information. So we need to find ways to, to compact and reduce the amount of data that we show to you. Um, and also depending on the context that you're in. So lots of the, the real tricky challenges for self-management tools really are on the user interface and how you visualize the information. Yeah. Self by itself is, is pretty much autonomous and it gets quite a long way without supervision. Um, but once there is something that you need to take a look into, you should be able to figure out quickly what's going on and what you need to do. Also one important thing, um, is that we want to create a tool that you can use um, as a complement to your usual tools. So we, we want to make sure that you can still manage Ceph on the command line, making changes if you need, and we as OpenEdit shouldn't get confused by that. And especially if you're talking about a, a cluster system with so many moving parts and so many objects that you need to keep track of, this really is a challenge, um, especially if, if the, the data model that your infrastructure uses um, and, and the, the code base that we have with Django basically kind of assumes that everything that we manage is part of our local database. So there, there are kind of two conflicting requirements here that we had to come up with a solution for. So questions that we had to ask, okay, where do we start? Which is the right self-management API? And as I already said, right now we are using the Python bindings, libradios, and librbd to get the first steps done that we have started with. Um, but in general, the question, how do you manage such a distributed system that acts pretty autonomous and makes changes by itself that you need to keep track of? How do you monitor this? Um, you need to be able to not only monitor the entire cluster's health and performance, but you want to be able to take a look at how is that disk doing? How much IOPS is it getting? And what about the process running on top of that disk? Is, is this all in balance or is there a problem that you need to take a look at? So w with the, the size of the cluster increasing, you will also have to monitor and store quite a lot of runtime information. And how can that be done in a scalable fashion is, is a very tough challenge. And then, of course, 
Um, the, our existing model currently is that there, every system that is managed by OpenAttic needs to have an OpenAttic run, instance running on top of it because we use our system D to perform tasks. This is something that we don't want to do in the case of Ceph because we, it would just add too much requirements and would add too much um, yeah, baggage on top that you don't want to have on all the, the various Ceph nodes. So how do you do the remote management here? Um, and how do you monitor it in a, in, a, in a scalable way? So one of the things that we first have to think of, how, how can we marry or combine what we have with Django with the information that we need from the cluster? And, and we basically extended Django in a way that allows us to use its, its normal data structures, which are called Django models. Um, Django models basically allow you to define your business objects and their relations to each other. And by default, Django stores that information in the Postgres database. Um, for Ceph, we've come up with a system where we basically query the Ceph cluster directly for this information without going through the database. But we are still able to use Django models for defining the relationships and the properties around them. And that's currently done using Librados and LibRBD for the communication part. So with that in place, we were really able to, to add um, a lot of functionality in the OpenAttic backend that allows us to, to manage or keep track of the various objects that we are interested in. Um, to give you an update or an overview how we, where we currently stand, so the, the, this NoDB backend framework is in place now. Um, it's already possible to map RBDs, which are block devices. Um, from an OpenAttic perspective, these block devices that are stored in the Ceph clusters look like uh, a regular hard disk. It can then be used to share or create a file system on top of it. Um, yeah, those acronyms or terms probably don't make much sense if you're not familiar with Ceph, so bear with me and attend Owen's talk for more details on that. But pools, OSDs, RBDs are all elements that, are, that make up a Ceph cluster and that you want to be able to, to take a look at and see how they're going. Um, so we've created table views for that. I have screenshots that show some more details here. And of course, top level entire health of a cluster and its performance is something that you want to be manage, uh, monitor and visualize. And, and that's something that we're currently working on. So the next step now is that we create kind of a dashboard within OpenAttic that gives you the overall cluster health and performance at a glance. Um, for that, we also had to rework the way on how we do monitoring using Nagios, for example. Um, by default, we, we use Nagios and PNP for Nagios to store the, the time-based data in RRD files on the disk. And we would then create PNG images out of the data and, and display them on the web page. Uh, you're pr probably very familiar with those graphs, which are created by RRD tools, and they have been around for quite some time. Um, now with the new JavaScript-based web interface, um, we want to make the, the visualization of these graphs a bit more interactive and yeah, a bit more modern looking also. I mean, RID2 graphs are something that you have seen in the last century already, and they haven't changed much since then. Simply because, I mean, they, they do display valuable information and get the job done, but from a UI perspective, they, they look kind of old. So we wanted to come up with them a more flexible scheme. So we are currently working on, on the backend code that will return the, the data stored in RIDs, not as a PNG file, but as a JSON object. And then the web UI basically can parse the JSON and display the information. And you will be able to interactively zoom into the graph and, and get much more detailed information without us having to recreate a PNG all the time. Um, something that we also have built in from, from the beginning is support for multiple Ceph clusters. Um, there, there's some debate going on. I just had a discussion with Owen yesterday about this, that um, most people usually will only have one Ceph cluster, and so adding support for multiple clusters might sound like overkill. But then again, you might have companies where they have a test and a production environment, and they want to separate that. Um, but in reality, I don't think that we will be managing tens or hundreds of Ceph clusters. But you never know, predictions can be wrong. But at least it's, it's a design decision that we've made pretty early on that support for multiple self clusters should be possible. 
Um, yep, this is kind of a quick overview of the REST API that we have created for self-management to give you an impression on where we are when it comes to RBD block devices and those things. The REST API is basically self-documenting, so if you point your web browser to one of these URLs, you will get an HTML page with all the, the available options. So creating a, a REST API call is, is pretty convenient. Um, and this wiki page down here basically will also be updated as soon as we make more um, changes or improvements. There are still a few open spots, as you can see here. We are definitely not done yet, but I think we have made good progress in the last half year. Okay, kind of an outlook. Where we are going, especially with Ceph, is of course um, have a, the, the cluster dashboard with the performance graphs. This is where currently in progress. Um, the whole part about pools, OSDs, RBDs need to be extended. Right now, um, it's pretty much read-only monitoring, so you can take a look at all the objects, you can sort them in various ways to, to get more details about them. But of course, we want to allow you to create new objects like pools, modify the configurations of the existing objects, and maybe even delete them and things like that. Um, CephFS is going to be a, an important part. Um, that has just been recently announced as stable with Ceph Jewel, the latest release. So it basically is a way to mount a file system kind of similar to an NFS share on multiple machines where the data is stored in the Ceph cluster. And it remains consistent regardless of where you make changes to the data. So um, it reduces a lot of overhead that you currently have if you want to use um, traditional file systems on top of a Ceph cluster. Right now, you always have to take kind of a, a workaround by creating an RBD block device and then share it via Samba or NFS or whatever. So CephFS will take away a lot of overhead here. And of course, right now, our assumption, or well, the, the current state and where we are is that we basically assume that the Ceph cluster is already up and running. The only thing we need is an administrator key to access the, the Ceph cluster and be able to communicate with it. Um, at a later state, we would like to be able to deploy entire Ceph nodes or maybe even set up an entire Ceph cluster from scratch. And for that, we are looking into using SALT as the, the methodology and the technology behind it. So um, at some point, we don't expect you to have a Ceph cluster running, but maybe you, you are able to spawn up new nodes that have a Ceph minion and nothing else. And OpenAttic is then kind of acting as a SALT master. The new nodes register, and you can then define a new role, and, and OpenAttic takes care of installing the appropriate software that is needed to perform the duties. Or if you want to create a new storage node, um, OpenAttic should be able to list you all the hard disk drives. Um, you should be able to create OSD processes that use these disks with the selected profiles that you want to use, things like that. Again, this is all public, um, especially around oh, Ceph, we have created quite a number of issues. Um, we, we summarized and grouped them by the various um, stories like OSD management, RBD management. And we, we try to, to break all these tasks down into chewable pieces so that each of these JIRA issues is something that someone could grab and work on and, and have success and, and would help us to, to improve the functionality. Um, some of the, the issues are a bit more larger and complex, but there's a lot of small things and, and, and groundwork that needs to be done in order for us to make progress. Um, and well, we try to have work items that can be worked on within our cycle of about four to five weeks. So that's, uh, we, we de define this as our sprint, basically. Um, we, and the work that goes on in the development branch is then run through Jenkins for testing, for example. Um, we have an automated test suite that tests um, unit tests in the Python code. We have a dedicated test suite that does nothing else than testing the REST API. And we also have a test for the web UI itself. So we, we basically have a kind of a, a job that clicks through the GUI and checks if, if the GUI responds um, accordingly to our expectations. Um, so that's one of the areas that we have a very close focus on is maintaining quality of the code by adding test cases, running them all the time. Um, new code is only merged into the development branch after a code review has been performed. So we use pull requests and 
we require that basically as much people from the team as possible take a look at, at, at a difference or a patch and review and approve it. Even though, well, sometimes it's JavaScript code that's being submitted and we still would like the, the Python developers to take a look because, well, some errors can be caught just by looking at it, even though you're not that familiar with the language, but the more eyeballs, the better is our approach here. So, yes, the roadmap is public. Um, you can see all the work items that we are currently working on during a sprint. We have a long backlog and pipeline of things that are um, coming. So, feedback and input is always welcome. Also, if you think that something is missing, um, I have a list of resources. We have a Google group for communication. We are on Freenode IRC, so it should be fairly easy to get in touch with us. That's a, uh, a a little round of screenshots. I didn't dare to challenge the demo god, so um, this is not a live demo, but just some screenshots. But we do have a live demo on our website that you can toy around with if you want to, so you don't have to install it yourself. This is a view of the traditional storage management dashboard, um, number of hosts that are up, number of disks that are active. This is a pretty small setup, but at least it gives you an impression how this currently looks like. This is a view of the Ceph pool list. This cluster just has two pools. You have a little bar graph that shows you the utilization um, and, and the, the content and how this information is being displayed is still kind of being improved um, in iterations over time. We, we wanted to get a first draft of, of the concept out to the users so they can take a look at it and then we are going to refine and improve it based on the feedback that we get. So we are really very open and very keen on, on getting um, input and suggestions on how this could be made um, better and more useful. Same for the OSD list. This is basically a list of all the, the storage processes that actually store the data in a Ceph cluster, um, their status, um, and some other related information. And one of the things that we started early on with, and this is really going deep into Ceph internals, but the the whole concept around of Ceph revolves around a technology called the crush map, which is an algorithm that basically determines on where an object is being stored in the cluster. So, and in particular, where it can be found again. And, and, and this is really what sets Ceph apart from other distributed storage systems that I, as a client, can use this crush map to basically determine where to find the object I'm looking for. And I can directly talk to the, the storage node, the OSDs, to obtain that data without going through any central instance. And that basically makes Ceph um, highly scalable um, and also gives us other nice features like redundancy. Um, the crush map basically allows you to, to kind of tune the algorithm to make sure that your required level of redundancy is being fulfilled. Um, for example, here you have a way to create a data center with racks, with machines in, in them. A and the crush map editor gives you a way to, to basically drag and drop those items to, to ch make changes to the crush map. Be advised this, that this is also a very dangerous operation because as soon as you've made changes and you commit them, Ceph will be very busy shuffling data around because it needs to make sure that it fulfills the requirements and the redundancy that you've just defined. Um, so this is usually an operation that you do usually once during the initial design based on your requirements, and then you, you leave it alone unless you really have an urgent need to change it. Because this is a, an easy way to make your cluster completely busy with itself and nothing else. Anyway, um, this is a screenshot of the traditional storage volume management. Um, down here you can see a graph which is created with RRD tool. I'm sure you're familiar with those from, from other systems. As you see, we, we always reuse the same UI elements in this time. These are really volumes and shares, so basically an NFS share or an iSCSI volume. Um, that too, well, again, we are open for feedback on how this can be improved or can be made more useful. One of the cool things that I learned about before I joined the company, and I, I found it quite unique, that's why I'm mentioning it here, even though it's kind of silly. And we have a, what we call the API recorder. Um, that's a tool that we've integrated in the web UI. As I said, the, the web UI 
does nothing than issuing REST API calls in the back end. And as a developer, I sometimes want to perform a task in an automated way by creating a small script around it, but I, I'm too lazy to look at the documentation. So what the API recorder basically does is um, I enable it, perform the task on the GUI that I want to fulfill, for example, create a share, create a pool, create a file system, and when I'm done with my changes, I, I stop the API recorder, and what it does is it creates a small Python script which contains exactly those Python REST API calls that I've created, so I can use this as a template for my own scripts if I want to. Pretty nifty. It can also help for debugging. Um, in case you have a customer with a particular problem, he can use the API recorder to reproduce that case and send us a script that we can then use to, to perform the same task. And with that, I'll leave you alone with a few links. Basically, all you have to know is openaddict.org. Everything else is linked from there. This is our live demo. Don't break it. Um, we blog frequently. Docs are written in restructured text sphinx. So if you are having fun in writing documentation, patches are always welcome. Bitbucket is where our code is tracked with Mercurial. This is our Jira instance. Google Plus, Twitter, the usual suspects. And with that, I see there's a question from Lars. It's a question. Ah, there we go. So it's not actually a question. Um, it's regarding OpenSUSE Hack Week. Mm -hmm. And so next week, the team from IT Novum and the team from SUSE is going to meet and hack on OpenAttic with a, a slight focus on Ceph for strange reasons. But so if other people from the OpenSUSE community or from any other community want to join us and hack OpenAttic and Ceph, we'll, you're all invited. Yes, thank you for the reminder. How could I even forget about that? So yes, indeed, um, the entire OpenAttic team will be in Nuremberg from Monday to Friday, um, hacking on the Ceph part of OpenAttic in particular, um, meeting with the SUSE folks, um, revisiting our plans, and discussing some architectural um, impacts, so especially the things like that I mentioned with regards to salt management or how to perform remote node monitoring. These things are still heavily under debate. We have a few ideas. Um, we do have I identified a few possible tools that we could use for that. As I mentioned, salt for the remote management is, is pretty much set. Um, for the remote node monitoring, we are looking into using CollectD as an option. Um, but if you are familiar with other technologies, if you have input, please join us, join the discussion, hack with us. We would be more than happy to, to host you. Okay, any other questions? Doesn't seem to be the case. In that case, thank you for your time.